So good afternoon to everybody. Happy New Year also to everybody. Um, well, first of all, uh, I want to thank Nick and all the organizers for inviting me to participate on these seminars on cyanobacteria. I'm very glad to, to have the opportunity to share uh, the research that we are conducting with all of you. Um, I hope um, this seminar results interesting for you. So uh, the title of my presentation is Biocrat Cyanobacteria as a tool for restoration of the gravid uh, dry, dry land soils. Um, first of all, uh, I want to introduce uh, our group, our research uh, team. So we are the group of uh, ecohydrology and restoration of uh, drylands. So, um, so our team is uh, integrated by different researchers. So the head of the group is uh, Jolanda Canton. Then uh, there are several postdoc researchers, including me, and also several uh, PhD students that are uh, currently um, developing different experiments for their uh, um, PhD thesis. Um, well, our um, research lines are uh, mainly focused on the study of biocrats, their uh, role in water balance, in carbon balance, and um, on erosion in these landscapes, in drylands. Uh, we also develop different, different research lines uh, regarding uh, ecohydrology. Uh, dryland degradation and how uh, to restore uh, degraded soils in, in drylands. Uh, we also study carbon fluxes in drylands. And um, I think the most interesting aspect um, of the research that we uh, do is the, that we apply a multi scalar approach uh, in our studies. So we are able to, to apply from microscopic or molecular uh, biological techniques. Uh, to other uh, methodologies to analyze soil properties or ecosystem processes on, on larger scales. Uh, I mean, using, by using remote sensing techniques or uh, geographic information systems. So we combine different techniques at different scales uh, to, to tackle our studies. Um, well, um, if you want more information about uh, our activities, um, of, about our group, here you can visit our website. So first of all, so to introduce the, the topic, I want to give some, so, so put, put in context, so the, the investigations that we are uh, developing. So dry lands represent around 40% uh, of the earth land surface. And it's predicted that uh, by 2050, uh, they will represent more than 45% of the land surface. And these areas support around 35% of the world's population. But these areas uh, are especially vulnerable because of the extreme conditions that characterize these areas, such as water scarcity, low vegetation cover, low soil, soil fertility, and poor soil structure. These uh, areas are undergoing uh, very serious uh, land degradation problems due to increasing pressure, human pressure, over these regions due to the intensification of agricultural land and also in, uh, the application of inadequate agricultural practices and also due to the impacts of uh, climate change that predict an increase in temperature and a decrease in rainfall for the next decades. So uh, this will aggravate land degradation processes in these areas and actually it's uh, been estimated that around 12 million of hectares are degraded every year in drylands. This will reduce the capability of dryland soils to provide ecosystem services such as water filtering and storage, the capacity to provide substrate for living organisms, uh, their ability to regulate the carbon and nitrogen cycling, and also their uh, ability to act as uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases uh, uh, reservoirs. So uh, we will need to restore the degraded lands. Um, uh, the traditional restoration uh, based on the establishment of a plant cover uh, many times that, uh, doesn't succeed in these areas because of the harsh conditions that we have in these 
uh, in Ryland. So we, we need to look for um, alternative strategies. So in these areas, we have a soil community that cover the open spaces between plants uh, which is known as biocrust, and that is the soil epidermis in, in Rylands. They are a community uh, composed of different organisms, and bacteria, algae, macrophagy, lichens, masses, in association with soil particles that cover all these open spaces between shrubs. And um, although they represent a very a small fraction of the soil profile of just a few millimeters depth, they are very important because they regulate the water, matter, and energy fluxes between the atmosphere and the soil surface. And because of this, they have a key role in numerous ecosystem processes. So uh, they regulate uh, water movement in the soil and also water retention in the soils of the water balance. They influence evaporation, soil moisture, runoff, infiltration. Uh, they also affect, uh, modif they modify a lot of uh, soil uh, variables that affect soil fertility and stability. So they increase aggregation, they increase uh, surface roughness, they increase stability, and also they usually increase the carbon and nitrogen contents of the soil. Uh, so those, they reduce erosion and increase soil fertility. And because of all these uh, modifications in the soil, they also improve vegetation establishment and also their productivity by supplying water and nutrients to, to the vegetation patches. So uh, our group has studied for a long uh, time, uh, for many years, uh, 15, 20 years, the role of, um, the, of biocrust in the local water balance and you know, on erosion in different dryland ecosystems in Southeast Spain. During all this time that we have studied different, how different biocrust types influence, for example, infiltration, soil moisture, um, all the components of the water balance, we find that it's more developed. It means a higher cover of cyanobacteria, higher biomass, and also when it's occupied by later successional organisms such as lichens and mosses, infiltration increases in most um, rainfall events compared to the bare soil. Soil moisture is also higher in the soil covered by cyanobacteria compared to, to bare soils. They significantly reduce sediment yield uh, in the soil. It, it, this is one of their most important role in these areas, the protection of the soil against erosion. We have also studied uh, the role or how this biocrust affect the carbon balance in drylands. So uh, we have measured CO2 fluxes in the crust. Uh, we measure photosynthesis and respiration um, because they are able to fix the atmospheric carbon and also uh, the nitrogen, the atmospheric nitrogen, and released the fixed carbon and nitrogen into the surrounding soil, increasing the organic carbon content and the nitrogen content of the soils. And this effect is uh, more important as the biocrust is more developed. So because of uh, all these roles that they play in these environments, we propose the use of biocrust for restoration of degraded soils. There are different approaches based on the use of, of biocrust uh, for uh, soil restoration. One approach is to collect biocrust in the field and redistribute the collected material to the degraded area that needs to be restored. But this has a very important limitation, and is that the harvesting of uh, intact biocrust may cause an additional disturbance in, in this site. Uh, so we are degrading, degrading a site to, to, to restore uh, a different site. So this is, this, uh, this is not a very, um, I mean, we would search for other approaches that don't, doesn't cause this alteration. So another approach is to collect a small amount of biocrust in the field and then grow them under greenhouse conditions. And we can grow single communities of lichens, moss, mosses, or mixed 
communities, the whole biocrust community. This is one approach. Um, another approach is the isolation of single species of the biocrust and cultivate them and, under laboratory conditions for their later inoculation on the soil. And this is the approach that we are investigating now. So, uh, and especially, uh, so we are uh, using cyanobacteria to restore uh, degraded soils. Why we are interested uh, on cyanobacteria as inoculants for restoration? So one reason is because cyanobacteria are the first colonizers of uh, terrestrial ecosystems, and they are the pioneer organisms that facilitate and improve conditions for the uh, colonization and establishment of other biocrust organisms such as lichens and mosses. Uh, another reason is that they fix the atmospheric CO2 and some species are able uh, also to, to fix the nitrogen, the atmospheric nitrogen, thus increasing uh, soil fertility. And they also produce exopolysaccharide compounds that have a very important role in the retention of water in the soil and in soil stability. They are also able to resist the stressful conditions that we have in drylands. So high UV radiation, uh, high salinity concentrations, water scarcity, and long periods of drought. They are able to survive under these harsh conditions. Um, another important advantage is that they can be uh, isolated from the biocrust from the soil and culture uh, ex situ using bioreactors. In this context, we have, uh, in the last years, we have developed different experiments to, to analyze the effect of cyanobacteria inoculation on the improvement of soil properties with the, with the idea of using this cyanobacteria uh, with restoration purposes. Our study sites are located in, in, in the province of Almeria in southeast Spain, and these are the main ecosystems in, in which we have developed our experiments. So uh, from higher, it, they also represent a gradient of degradation from lower, degra from higher degradation. This is a quarry. Uh, then we have um, another site in the Tabernas Desert, El Cautivo, and uh, the less uh, degraded, degraded site, which is Las Amoladeras, located in the Cabo de Gata Natural Park. So uh, along this gradient, you can see that uh, the soil organic carbon increases, also the, the total nitrogen content, and uh, biocrust cover is also lo it's lower in the most degraded place and increases in the in the other more uh, in the other less degraded sites. Um, well, uh, we collected uh, biocrust samples from these uh, three different areas, and we isolated different native cyanobacteria species. Uh, we applied a polyphasic method in which we use uh, the morphological features of, uh, of the strains uh, combined with molecular analysis, with DNA, with DNA, DNA sequencing, and also the ecological characteristics. We combine all uh, of these uh, methods to identify the cyanobacterial strains that we had on, on the biocrust, and we identified uh, different species belonging to different groups. So within the uh, filamentous non-heterocystous cyanobacteria, we have uh, we isolated uh, is a species from the genus Leptolimbia, Leptolimbia frigida, and also belonging to the bundle uh, forming cyanobacteria, we isolated Trichocolis desertorium and Microcolis. And we also uh, identified uh, three species belonging to, to the Heterocystus cyanobacteria. Uh, specifically, we uh, identified Sichonema yelinum, Tolipotrix distorta, and Nostocumum. Um, we have, uh, we also developed uh, a study to analyze the abundance of uh, the different cyanobacteria species present in the soil and their relationship with the degradation of the site. So this is, I am not going to describe in detail this, um, this study. If you want more information, here you have the, the reference to, to the article. But just to mention that we found a relationship between the abundance of sun, of sun species and the degradation of the land. So uh, we found that 
the abundance of, of sun species increase uh, with degradation. Uh, it means that there is more abundance of, of sun species in more degraded sites. And these species were uh, these ones belonging to the filamentos non heterocystus, Leptolimbia and Trichocolis desertorum, and also these uh, species belonging to to uh, the Terocystos group, Citonema, Tolipotris, as non stock uh, commune. So uh, there were previous works that identified Microcolus uh, like the pioneer cenobacteria in this uh, in this uh, in in the soil that they are the pioneer uh, cenobacteria species colonizing the soil. But for example, we found that uh, there were other pioneer uh, cenobacteria that were even more abundant in in the graded soils, which is which are these ones. So we used this information because uh, they may suggest that this uh, species could be more suitable as candidates uh, for inoculation and for restoration of degraded soils. So we developed def different experiments to analyze the effect of cyanobacteria inoculation and uh, the effect on different soil types. We have worked mainly with the heterocystus uh, species because they are able to, to fix nitrogen and also because they are uh, easier to culture. We performed an experiment where we inoculated this, uh, these strains individually and also as a mixture, as a consortium on the soil and on these three soil types uh, belonging to each of the study areas that I described before. Um, so we maintained, we incubated the samples for three months. So this experiment was conducted uh, in the laboratory. This concentration uh, of the six grams per square meter of, of the inoculum. And uh, we maintained this experiment for uh, three months. And after three months, we measured different uh, variables in the soil uh, to, to evaluate, to assess uh, cyanobacteria performance or growth. So uh, we took pictures to, uh, of the samples, to um, images of the, of the samples to measure cyanobacterial cover. We also measured the reflectance of the soil. And from this data, we calculated different indices that, um, that help us to, to evaluate, to assess cyanobacterial growth, for example, the albedo or the uh, spectral absorption due to chlorophyll. And we also collected samples to analyze chlorophyll A content, organic carbon and nitrogen content. So here uh, I, I'm showing some of these of the results that we obtained. So uh, we measure the cover of the of the samples, and what we found is that um, for the three sites, uh, the the increase in cover, we um, the variables are expressed as uh, the gain. So in comparison with the initial soil that we used for the experiment. So the cover gain uh, was higher in the soils inoculated with the mixture uh, and also with Nosto commune. Uh, and this was observed in the, uh, in the three types of soils. When we have a look at the chlorophyll A gain, we also observe that in general, the soils inoculated with the consortium and with Nostra commune uh, showed higher chlorophyll A gain. Uh, then we found also some exception, as for example at El Cautivo, where we found also a very high uh, chlorophyll content in the soils inoculated with Tolipotrix uh, distorta. But this was just on, on, at the site. Um, when we uh, analyze the, the albedo, we see that this albedo decreased also, was lower in the soils um, inoculated with Nostra commune and the mixture of the three uh, species. Uh, we use this variable because as, as cyanobacteria uh, grow in the soil, the soil, the soil gets darker. Uh, so a reduction in albedo is uh, an indicator of biocrass or biocrass development. And we also, uh, here is the reflectance curve of the surface. And we can see that, uh, so the albedo is lower in the soil inoculated with cyanobacteria. And also we observe this absorption here, which is due to chlorophyll A, which is present in the inoculated soil um, and not present in the non-inoculated soil. So this is also an indicator of cyanobacteria growth. 
Here uh, you can see the uh, gain in organic carbon and in nitrogen content in the different treatments uh, for the different sites. And uh, we found that uh, soil inoculation with the mixture and also commune uh, led to a higher increase in the organic carbon and nitrogen content in the soils. Um, as an example, I want to show uh, the results of the Gador Quarry, which is in the poorest, um, the soil from this site is the poorest and the most degraded soil. And here it uh, is when, where we observed uh, a higher effect of this, a higher increase in, in the carbon uh, content and nitrogen content and due to xenoxyl inoculation. So we observe uh, gains in organic carbon and in nitrogen over 1000% uh, in the soil. And we have found similar results in other experiments using other strains, uh, for example, for median and beyonds, Shidonema javanicum. Uh, we have also found uh, increases, uh, significant increases in organic carbon and nitrogen uh, when the soils uh, are inoculated with this cyanobacteria. Uh, and uh, an important um, soil property that is also improved by cyanobacteria inoculation is aggregate stability. So we see that uh, the aggregate stability is higher in the inoculated soils. It also depends on the type. So the defect uh, changes depending also on the strain and the soil type. But uh, in general, we found an, an improvement in soil aggregation. This is very important because one of the most important processes affecting land degradation drylands is erosion. So uh, the protection that uh, cyanobacteria confers uh, to the soils uh, can help uh, to, to mitigate this problem. So this, this is a good uh, indicator of, uh, this is one of the improvements of cyanobacteria inoculation in the soil. Um, well, in a second experiment, uh, also in the conducted under laboratory conditions, uh, we, uh, our goal was to test if the reduction of the water availability uh, would affect cyanobacteria performance in the soil. So we replicated this experiment, but reducing the amount of water applied. Instead of uh, applying irrigation every four days, we applied irrigation every eight days, uh, simulating a dry year in, in, in our study sites. The results were that the water in treatment had a significant effect on all the properties uh, measured. Here we measure also the exopolysaccharides content of the soil. So in general, we found a higher growth uh, when moisture availability was higher. But we also found that there was a significant interaction between with the water in treatment and the inoculation treatment, meaning that different strains responded um, differently to the water in uh, frequency. So uh, uh, one interesting result was that Nostoc commune uh, showed higher cover, high, a higher growth than the other strains under uh, the dry regime. And um, uh, also, for example, when we uh, carbon gain, we also observed that, uh, that this content was higher in the soil inoculated with Nostoc commune than with the other strains under dry conditions. But more interestingly is that uh, even under this drier regime, Nostoc commune led to a higher increase in soil organic carbon content compared to, to other strain uh, to other to the other strains under the wet regime with higher water availability. And this good performance of Nostoc commune is associated to their higher ability to synthesize exopolysaccharide compounds. So here we can see that the, the exopolysaccharides gain uh, was higher in the soils inoculated with Nostoc. And we distinguish two different fractions, the loosely bound EPS, which are those more soluble, and the tightly bound EPS, which are those more condensed and more um, strongly attached to soil particles. Um, so we found that the Nostoc was able to, to, to increase the, the amount of the two fractions of EPS. And also this good performance, even under uh, dry conditions, can be associated to their capacity to produce huronic acid, 
acids that are uh, released by this strain to cope uh, with desiccation, to survive under desiccation conditions. We conducted a specific experiment with this uh, strain, with Nostocumium, to try to optimize their culture and their laboratory conditions. We used a different uh, medium uh, to culture this cyanobacteria. We used um, uh, the traditional uh, BG11 medium to grow uh, this cyanobacteria without nitrogen and with nitrogen. Um, and then we also tried to grow this uh, cyanobacteria using uh, this medium, this medium that made with fertilizer. So the difference is that we try to, let's say, simulate the traditional chemical medium, but made with fertilizers in order to uh, reduce the cost of the production of the of the biomass. So um, what we found is that. Um, the use of uh, the medium made with fertilizers gave similar results uh, in terms of growth uh, to the use of the medium made with chemical fertilizer, with chemical, with the traditional chemicals. Um, uh, we also applied, uh, we uh, applied the cyanobacteria, the biomass with the medium into this in the soil. Uh, to see what was the effect of this inoculation in the soil. So here you can see the soil organic carbon and the polysaccharides content. So we apply different treatments. So the control, which is the non-inoculated soil, where we apply the, just the medium without the cyanobacteria biomass. Another treatment where we apply just the biomass without the medium. And these uh, four treatments that uh, consists of the application of the cyanobacteria of the cyanobacteria with the medium where they were grown okay so what we can see is that uh, the uh, the effect of cyanobacteria on organic carbon and polysaccharides was higher when we uh, inoculated the cyanobacteria together with the medium we have uh, better results if we apply both together, the biomass with their medium, okay? And that the best results were found with this medium made with fertilizers, the Mann and Myers uh, medium made with fertilizers instead of with the traditional chemicals. So, and here we analyze the cost of this growth methodology. So here you have the price for the two media the maximum concentration that we achieve with uh, each medium and the needed biomass that we uh, would need to inoculate per hectare. So uh, by using the, this medium made with fertilizers, we could save uh, as much as 300 euros per hectare. Uh, if we want to apply this um, strategy to larger scales. So we found a way to optimize the culture of Nostoc commune and uh, let's say to develop a cheaper methodology for application of, of this technology. So after testing the effect of cyanobacteria under, field, under laboratory conditions, we moved to the field uh, because we wanted to see uh, the performance of cyanobacteria under natural conditions. Um, where we have some successful examples of cyanobacteria on the field in some use in China. In China. So there have been some experiments uh, in China uh, applying different uh, cyanobacteria strains. Um, they have shown successful results in immobilizing uh, sand dunes and preventing the certification of these dunes. But areas of the world that where uh, this technology has been also tested, results ha uh, have not been so successful. We applied this strategy, so the direct cyanobacteria inoculation on the soil. We conducted on this experiment uh, some years ago, some time ago. So we selected uh, plots of one meter for one, so of one square meter. And uh, we uh, inoculated cyanobacteria at the same concentration that and, uh, done at the laboratory experiments where we found good uh, results. Um, where, uh, well, what we found, we found that uh, after inoculating cyanobacteria, we performed this experiment uh, on the three sites that I described 
uh, always in the same three sites. And we found that after six months, uh, there was no significant difference in chlorophyll content between control and inoculated soils. We th think that, that uh, this uh, result uh, was due to the fact that um, the, there were numerous cracks after the inoculation. Uh, we observed this, these cracks on the, on the induced biocrust, uh, probably caused by the expansion contraction of clay particles and also the, um, the viscolastic properties of the exopolysaccharides produced by cyanobacteria. And uh, this, uh, so we had these uh, pieces of the biocrust that were very um, vulnerable to, to water erosion. So they were easily washed away by, by soil erosion. So that's, so I think we lost uh, part of the, the inoculum due to water erosion. And that's the reason that uh, we didn't find significant results in cyanobacteria uh, content after six months. Uh, um, we continue the monitoring of this experiment and after two years, uh, we observed no change in chlorophyll content or in the albedo. Uh, we didn't even find difference between control and the inoculated plots. And we only found significant differences in the soil organic carbon. We found higher organic carbon in the inoculated soils. And we think that this um, maybe uh, it, uh, it can be due to the decomposition of some of the remaining biomass on the plots, that not all the inoculum uh, was lost. Some remained in the plots um, due to their decomposition. Uh, so they incorporated this uh, organic carbon into the soil. So now we are trying, so after this experiment, we try to, to improve the performance of cyanobacteria under this field, this natural, under natural conditions, combining cyanobacteria inoculation with other strategies. So uh, there are two main strategies that have been um, explored in the literature that are, that, that are previous studies showing different uh, strategies to optimize cyanobacteria performance in the field. One is cyanobacterial hardening. It consists of the pre-acclimatation of the inoculum to the expected field conditions. It means uh, before inoculation, we increase the ex uh, exposure of the inoculum to solar radiation, we increase the temperature, uh, and uh, we reduce moisture availability in order to, to adapt the inoculum to the conditions that we expect in the field. Um, uh, it has shown successful results uh, for sun strains such as Micropolis, but the results are variable when using heterocystis strains, nitrogen fixing uh, strains. And another approach is um, to apply habitat amelioration techniques that they consist of reducing the biotic stress of the inoculum after inoculation. So uh, they consist mainly of increasing surface roughness um, or, or applying some, type, some type of shading, for example, by um, putting a cloth to cover the, the, the soil. So we uh, conducted a different experiment now just in one, in one of our study sites in selecting, by selecting a small plots. And here we combine two factors. That uh, one was the inoculation treatment that consisted of uh, no inoculation, so no application of the inoculum, the direct uh, cyanobacteria inoculation in which we uh, hardened the inoculum, okay? So previous to their inoculation, we adapt the inoculum by uh, increasing the, um, uh, the exposure to radiation and decreasing water availability. And also the other factor for was uh, to apply some type of habitat amelioration technique. So in this case, we cover the soil with a plastic grid and with a vegetal fiber mesh. So we found that uh, in general, hardening the inoculum did not significantly improve cyanobacterial growth. So here you can see that there were no significant differences between the hardened inoculum and the non-hardened inoculum. So when we applied uh, directly the, the cyanobacteria uh, biomass. 
but uh, so we observe this for the chlorophyll A content and also in the albedo, we didn't find uh, significant differences. But um, we found that uh, applying uh, uh, habitat amelioration techniques improves cyanobacterial growth. We found higher chlorophyll content and lower albedo in the covered soils, and especially in the soil covered with the, with the vegetal mesh. It's, uh, it was the treatment that showed a better um, performance. So we uh, conducted more uh, detailed analysis on this, on this uh, treatment. We analyzed the properties of the polysaccharides uh, on these soils. So we analyzed the molecular weight uh, distribution of the polysaccharides uh, released into the soil in these treatments. And in general, we found that the more soluble, uh, loosely bound polysaccharides were composed of lower um, mole molecular weight uh, molecules, while the more condensed fraction was composed of higher molecular weight molecules. This, is, this has been that uh, we found in previous uh, works, that has been found in previous works, or we, the loosely bound uh, fraction is composed of a smaller, uh, sugars. But what is more interesting is that when we compare the different treatments, we found that within the, the, this fraction, the more soluble fraction, uh, the soil that was covered by the mesh uh, show uh, polysaccharides with higher uh, molecular weight, so heavier uh, EPS. When analyzing the monosaccharidic composition, uh, we observed, for example, that uh, the, the abundance of galacturonic acids was higher in the, in the non-covered soil, um, and this may reflect uh, um, a mechanism by which uh, cyanobacteria uh, produces these uh, monosaccharides, these sugars, to protect uh, the cyanobacteria the cells against desiccation. And this can be the reason why in the uncovered soil, we found this higher production of galacturonic acids. But when uh, we compare the, the, the soil cover with the mesh with the other treatments, we see that uh, we have higher abundance of glucose, which is the main source of energy for microbial activity, also for the heterotrophic activity in the soil. And also uh, we found higher abundance of silos. And this was very interesting because uh, we, all, we have also found in previous works that soils that are richer in organic carbon and in nitrogen, so they are more complex and they are more fertile. So they have higher abundance of this monosaccharide. So this higher uh, abundance of, of silos in this treatment in the soil inoculated with cyanobacteria and also covered with the mesh could be an indicator of higher by grass development, but we need to explore this uh, more in detail. So these are the results that we have found so far. And now we are continuing this research with new experiments where we want to explore uh, more in detail the, the, the use of cyanobacteria with different uh, strategies. So we are now conducting uh, more, um, so we have uh, done an outdoor experiment where we have combined the inoculation of cyanobacteria with uh, other kind of, of meshes. This one is built with a Stipa tenacissima. And um, we have also mixed the cyanobacteria with other with, uh, a plantago stabilizer amendment. And we are finding very uh, nice results. So we are um, applying also this, um, um, these strategies in the field. We have just one month ago, we have started new experiments in the field applying these this um, combination. And well, I'm not showing here uh, the results because actually we are preparing the, the, the article and, and so they are unpublished data. So I just wanted to tell you that, that we are obtaining good results combining these uh, cyanobacteria inoculation techniques with plant-based uh, strategies. Uh, we, are, uh, we are also exploring uh, more um, combinations. 
Uh, here, this is in collaboration with several companies, with two companies, and in, in, we are testing the performance of cyanobacteria inoculation with organic residues, for example, using sandwich sludge and also paper residues. This is a line of research that we are starting just now. To finish my presentation, I just want to show you that we also work at a larger scales, not only performing these uh, experiments at uh, smaller, special, uh, special scales, but we have also analyzed at larger scales how biocrafts affect vegetation performance in drylands. Here, this was an experiment that we conducted uh, here in, at El Cautivo site where we excluded runoff uh, the water provided uh, from the biocrass areas to the to the plant patches. So here we excluded this uh, water, this runoff supply from biocrass, and here uh, we uh, allow this water and nutrients provided from biocrass to get to be intercepted by the plant to see the effect of this of these resources supply by biocrass. And we found actually higher biomass and higher productivity in the in the plants that receive these inputs from the biocrass areas. Um, we have also analyzed how uh, different terrain attributes control biocrass spatial distribution uh, at our site. So there are different factors that affect the the biocrass distribution in our site. So the different biocrust and vegetation occupy different uh, positions in the landscape that are associated to topographical factors. Uh, so the solar radiation, the slope, the, um, the areas more favorable for water accumulation, all these factors condition the position of vegetation and biocrust on this complex landscape. And we are using this information for future um, or for incoming uh, restoration projects where we want to combine uh, cyanobacteria with plants and we need to know how we should um, put them in the landscape. We need this information to know which are the most optimal uh, spatial distribution of biograss and plants to maximize the efficiency of in the use of the resources of water and nutrients. Um, and well, this is all. I hope our research uh, has been interesting for you and thank you very much for, for your attention.